Well, it's my pleasure to have a meeting here with Stephen England Hall, the Chief Executive Officer of Tourism New Zealand. Um, we go back a long way, Stephen and I, and uh, we're probably more like more like mates than we are really client um, supplier relationships. But very cool to you join us, and it's a new, new improved <laughs> version of Stephen. He's um, he's taking the opportunity, like a few people, during the breakdown to lose a bit of weight and get a bit healthier. You're looking good, mate. Looking really good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, you know, nothing like a fair load of stress and plenty of alcohol and late nights to keep you busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hey, look, what I thought I might do is, uh, you know, obviously tourism has just been absolutely mutilated by COVID-19 and I still want to bring a bit of positive element to this, but maybe just to set the scene a wee bit for us, just give a wee bit of context to Tourism New Zealand and what it is for us, how big it is, some of the dynamics, some of the, I suppose, some of the metrics yeah, of sure. tourism. Yeah. Yeah, so probably the best place to start is prior to COVID-19, tourism industry was generating about 40 billion a year in revenue. Um, it's about $3.4 billion a month, if you like, like, like that, in revenue. Um, in terms of output deliveries to New Zealand, it's roughly 7-8% of GDP. It's around about 13% of total GST tax take for the government um, as a sector. It employs about 1 in 10 Kiwis. Uh, and if you think about the international versus domestic split, your domestic uh, economy is worth about 58% of that $40 billion, so around $23 billion. And the other $17 billion is obviously foreign exchange. I think in terms of that $17 billion of foreign exchange, that's roughly about one in every $5 of export earnings for New Zealand. So tourism as a sector is, is pretty important to our economy. But perhaps more importantly, it also has spillover effects. You know, that 13% of GST tax take for the government, for example, um, that, you know, that's more than most of our industries, you know, most of our um, big tax items for the government you know, um, combined. So whether it be education or health or others, they all kind of make a, make a um, I guess, take a, take a part of that slice of, of that three point, sorry, about 13%. So it's, it's a big industry and it has some pretty big implications for, for our economy and our country. And in fact, what we'd like is Kiwis, right? I mean, mm. we've all got used to be able to drive to any town in New Zealand, have an amazing cafe and some really good places to eat and, you know, nice places to stay and all that sort of jazz. And that's really come about over the contribution of tourism over a longer period of time. You know, you've got even our cities like Christchurch, for example, where about, where about two thirds of the hospitality and entertainment options are only made possible because of tourism flows. You know, and other city centres will be similar to that. So with, a, with COVID-19 kind of putting the brakes on all that pretty, in pretty short order, it went from sort of $3.4 billion a month, you know, 13% uh, of GST take for the government, uh, one in 10 jobs, et cetera, et cetera. That came to zero in about four days, right? So it's um, it's been pretty impactful and it's going to take a little while to recover. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's a massive industry. And I think even when you start talking about that to understand, I suppose, the, the sequencing of all the other industries that are impacted um, as well. And it's it's bigger than being here, really. Um, I suppose just to crystal ball a wee bit, if, if we did sort of, look forward for the next 12 months, you know, what, what is the industry, what is tourism going to look like in New Zealand? Yeah, well, so um, I guess the first thing that sort of springs to mind is we're going to be a domestic tourism economy for, for a period of time. And then um, if everything goes to plan, we'll have a, a, a safe travel zone with Australia and possibly the Pacific Islands too um, within the next 12 months. So I, I would say I'd be very confident of the, at least part of that being true. Definitely the New Zealand piece. Um, I think we're all very keen to see Australia, um, you know, take a role in recovery, helping us recover. And then, of course, we've got um, the Pacific potentially on the horizon as well. So that, but that's that's quite speculative at this point, Dale. I mean, you know, none of us have got a crystal ball, uh, and none of us are sitting in the cabinet rooms of New Zealand or Australia, um, trying to understand exactly what that's going to look like and how that's going to unfold. But what I'd say for the next, at least for the next, you know, few months, it's going to be New Zealanders' paradise. And when you say about, I suppose, um, what is the industry saying? So, you know, you're very, very close to it. You're right at the forefront of it. What, what is the sentiment? Where are they at, um, I suppose, in the cycle? Are they frustrated? Are they excited or just clinging on by a thread, you know? I think it depends on who you talk to. I think for some of the industry, that they're pretty, there's a fair degree of frustration out there. Um, there's a feeling that, you know, um, this industry, which has been a, you know, a stalwart of 
New Zealand's wealth creation for more than a decade or maybe two decades. It's been a very important ingredient into in the lifestyles that we've become accustomed to. Um, it's been a key contributor to um, you know community well-being. Uh, local government and also central government have benefited significantly from the flow of tourism over the last decade. And I think uh, for some in the sector, there's definitely a feeling of man, this is this whole situation's really slammed us pretty hard. And we're not, you know, some of them are not feeling that they've had enough support as a consequence of you know, equal support from the contribution they've given. I think um, yeah, there is probably some merit in all of that, but of course the government is in a difficult position where they've got to contend with the impacts of COVID-19 on every sector of the economy and every part of New Zealand's lifestyle and life options and well-being and so forth, not just tourism. So I think you know, um, I don't. Perhaps it doesn't matter what answer the government would have given. It's probably never going to be <laughs> um, the right answer for everybody. So there's a degree of frustration out there for sure. Having said that, there are many, many operators and many, many tourism businesses who have, you know, taken it on the chin and tried to find a path through the, the last few months, leveraged things like the wage subsidies and IRD loan schemes and business finance guarantees and others, or gone to the private markets and secured capital. Um, notwithstanding the needs for restructuring and things, that have made some pretty big, difficult decisions to survive the short term. And many of them are now starting to see a few green shoots with domestic tourism being on at level two, which obviously is earlier than anticipated initially. Domestic tourism was supposed to be level one. Um, so the fact that it was at level two meant that a number of businesses were able to start operating earlier than anticipated. Um, and of course, We've just had a three-day weekend. Three-day weekends are phenomenally important for the domestic tourism, uh, tourism economy, and that's definitely been the case this year. For sure, I'd say the performance of that weekend has probably helped a few of them um, stay open a bit longer. Uh, but look, there's a fair way to go before we get back to any real scale in the domestic tourism space. But a number of operators are just getting on with it. They are, you know, we've just got we've got to find a way through this. We are committed to surviving, and once we've survive we're going to revive our business and then we're going to get into this into the job of thriving and i think you know it's hard to get a put a number on it but there's definitely the plethora you know there's everything from people who have already shut up shop and maybe we may never see again some who have hibernated or mothballed their operations and really minimized their staffing down to skeletal levels to stay in existence until there's sufficient demand we've got others who have very quickly changed their entire proposition uh reduced their operating costs and and being able to navigate open in the short term. And then there are some who have actually, um, you know, been very fortunate to be in a position where they've, where they've really felt only a limited amount of impact in the, in the last few months. So it's been a real mixed bag. Um, when we talk about um, international, and obviously tourism New Zealand, a big part of what you do is, is marketing New Zealand abroad. Can you just talk about, I suppose, what that is, what the scenario is with that at the moment, and why you've still got the tap on on some on some initiatives overseas, and what that might bring to us. Yeah, it's a great question. We got, I got asked this question quite often, <clears throat> including by some of our you know government officials and so forth too. It's very important. There's probably a couple of very important things to consider about international markets and tourism for a country like New Zealand. So even at our peak, we were 0.29 percent of global tourism. So we are very, very small. Um, having said that, we're about 0.81% of global tourism spend. So what that says is the visitors who choose to come to New Zealand tend to spend a lot more on average than those who go to other places in the world. That's partly because we're so far away and it's partly because, you know, as a place to visit, we're comparatively pricey and there are other parts of the world that are obviously significantly cheaper. And New Zealand's not a mass tourism destination. We you know, we don't get 80 million tourists a year in New Zealand. We get something like 4 million, just under 4 million, of which only 2 million are actually holiday tourists. The other 2 million are friends and family, education and business. So we're a pretty small, we're a minnow in the global scheme of things. Now, even though we're a minnow, um, the economic contribution and the social and um, community contributions of tourism flow uh, are felt quite widely across our economy. Now, when, of course, all the world's borders are closed, people can't travel across them, but we forget that to choose New Zealand as a destination is not an overnight decision. It takes many months, if not years, to build sufficient brand equi equity and drive in the minds of consumers for them to choose New Zealand as a destination, commit to it by buying a ticket, and then plan out their holiday. And it 
And so what, we've, what we know from history and what we know from other marketing activity and research around the world is if a brand goes dark, what they mean, what we mean by that is it turns off. So we turn off brand New Zealand for six months. It will take three years for New Zealand to recover the same level of uh, mental mindshare, if you like, amongst the audiences as if we were continued on. If we go dark for 12 months, it will take us up to five years to recover the same amount of mindshare. So the economic opportunity lost for New Zealand of, of us being off the air is absolutely significant, even though they can't physically visit here today. And so we look at that and we go, well, if we keep our brand alive in the hearts and minds of consumers over the next six or 12 months and they can't physically come here, that will, con that will create sufficient brand continuity and equity or keep our equity alive so that when things do start to open, we can start to convert some of that traffic to actual passengers to New Zealand. The second thing is, oh, sorry, and of course we'll be able to do that faster than if we waited until the borders opened and started then. If we did that, we could be three to five years further behind the rest of the economy in terms of recovery. And of course that's going to have a pretty long-term effect on, on all aspects of life in New Zealand. So that's something we want to avoid. The second thing is the, um, the halo effects of our work. So when tourism New Zealand's out there in the market, marketing New Zealand as a destination, you know, whether it's you know, put, in, put New Zealand on the map or whether it's 100% um, pure or whether it's uh, you know, um, you know, pure values work or any of our activity offshore, what that does is it has a spillover effect to export products. So whilst we're talking about New Zealand in the media or in advertising in the UK, People in the UK actually, there's a brand resonance that exists for New Zealand, and that has a benefit on our wine sales, our lamb sales, our product exports, our you know consumer buying preferences, companies thinking about technology and so forth, all think, oh, New Zealand. So there's actually a halo effect of our brand that's really, really important to maintain. And of course, right now, people can't visit New Zealand, so keeping our brand alive and top of mind for them as they buy other products and, and consumables is very, very important. Um, just expanding on that, I suppose the, um, the government have done an incredibly good job and, and made us very proud around, I suppose, managing the health impact of this. And, and you know, I think as of today, we have got absolutely no active cases. Um, is there an opportunity for us to leverage that into the market? Is that, is that something that Tourism New Zealand might better take advantage of as well, around, the, I suppose, the purity piece? How we've, how yeah, we've possibly, possibly, it. Dale. I mean, it's a tricky one, right? Because... If we go and build a brand promise around zero COVID and then we get one, mm, that's not so good. Then that could that could <laughs> be highly yeah. destructive. Um, so so I think there's there's real value and power in us continuing to behave and be consistent with our core brand values around you know um, monarchy and tiaki and of course ingenuity and those are the three pillars if you like that underpin 100% pure New Zealand. And also underpin the global narrative about New Zealand that already exists. And so when we would say, you know, for example, we would say that when New Zealand chose to close its borders, that was an act of tiaki. And tiaki being care or guardianship of New Zealand and New Zealand is. So we'd say the decision to close our borders was in the interests of a value. And that value is called tiaki. And tiaki, of course, is taking care of our people and taking care of our country. And... You can't really argue with that because it's true, you know. And then we would say um, the way in which we've tried to, you know, humanise our response to this particular crisis and look after our people, you know, the decisions to, to get wage subsidies out and things that happen very, very, very quickly, much faster to, in my understanding to other countries as well. Those are all ways in which we have demonstrated our values, what we truly what we think is important, looking after our people, looking after our industries and so forth. And as, of course, we now move to open things up, the question will be how do we how do we do that in a way that's also consistent with our values? And actually, I I think as Kiwis we'd probably feel a bit weird about going out there and saying 100% pure New Zealand, 100% virus free. You know, it just doesn't feel very it just doesn't feel very us. You know, it's a bit it's not in any way humble. It's not in any way kind of conscious of our role in the world. It feels a bit too in your face. Um, for, for how we stand up in the world. So we probably wouldn't leverage it directly. I mean, indirectly, I think the fact that the world already sees New Zealand as a, as a beautiful place to visit with warm, welcoming people, rich in culture and heritage, and of course, with great food and wine and so forth. Um, 
that narrative already exists. So the fact that now the world thinks we're COVID free adds more weight to that story. It doesn't require us to, I don't believe, explicitly to say it. Does that, does that yeah, kind of make sense? Or? Yeah. Uh, and look, this, this video will be watched by thousands, and tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands. What, what do you want us as Kiwis, I suppose, what, what, if we could do something to support the industry, which you represent, um, what can we do? Well, I think, which is our latest, Sorry, you've just dropped since the 1980s, David. He's right. Can you say that again? I just missed that last bit. Yeah, sure, mate. No worries. Um, I was saying, um, do something new, New Zealand, is our new domestic marketing campaign. Um, it's been a domestic campaign in a long time. And, but at the, at, the, at the heart of it is this idea that we've got this incredible product here, incredible country, incredible cultural story. And um, maybe as Kiwis, we could try something new. Let's get out there and do something we haven't done before. If you live in Auckland or Wellington or Christchurch or Queenstown or Nelson or Kokoda or somewhere, there are so many things around you that people from all over the world choose to come here to New Zealand to do, but many Kiwis have never done. So I think it's an opportunity for us to explore our own backyard and, and to see what is out there. And some of those products and services you know, are commissioned, they're, they're, they're high quality, they require someone to buy a ticket and get access to them. Otherwise, others, you can just walk out there and experience it, you know, or maybe go in your bathers, as we say, you know, get into the ocean, or maybe not this time of year, it's pretty cold, but, you know, there's, like, just get out there, experience New Zealand, support local, um, you know, industry and businesses, cafes or restaurants, you know, go for a, go for a Sunday or weekend drive somewhere, uh, or if you can get a plane, get on the plane and go somewhere. Um, but really, this is a chance to explore your own country, because you can't go over, overseas, and other people can't come here, and so we've got this playground to, to enjoy. So I think the key thing there is just get out there and enjoy it and have fun, you know. And if you haven't tried mountain biking, have it a, give it a go, you know. If you haven't been for a walk through one of our, if you haven't done a great walk, do it. If you haven't zipped line on Waikiki Island, give it a crack, you know. If you haven't been to Rotorua and been to the mountain bike park, I'd recommend that, you know. Go to go to the Redwoods, experience it at night, you know, uh, or head to. You know, head to Tutukaka and look out to the Poor Nights Island. It's one of the top 10 dive sites in the world. You know, so there's so many things that you could do here that are, you know, range in, in price, range in, in um, experience offer, range in whether it's family, individual, friends, whatever. That, there's heaps to do in New Zealand, I think. Just give it a shot. Do so, and if you don't know what to do, search NewZealand.com, which is our Tourism New Zealand website. And there's about 8,000 products registered on there across the country that you can, that you can check out. Well, and it couldn't be a better time to be doing it, in all honesty, because it's going to be, it's never going to be quieter. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I, I was talking to some um, tourism operators over the, about the long weekend, uh, and pretty much every place in New Zealand had a lift over uh, Queen's birthday weekend wow. on the preceding couple of weeks, obviously being uh, early in lockdown, but, or early post lockdown, but, you know, a number, I mean, there's a number of places that were, sold out over Queen's birthday. That's fantastic news. Now, of course, it'll be quieter next weekend because generally when it's not a long weekend, things are quieter. But, uh, you know, if you've got time, get, take yourself, give yourself a Friday off work with the kids or whatever and go and experience the thing. That's awesome. Stephen, thank you. Um, it's really, really enlightening and, and um, I encourage people to take to heed your advice and support our country. We're very, very lucky. So um, thank you. Very yeah. insightful and really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, Dale. Good luck, mate. Yes.